Welcome to Norwich, set amidst the rural beauty of East England. This is an isolated, culturally unfashionable city, famed for its overstock of medieval cathedrals, brewing and mustard production. Best described by Nobel Prize winning writer Kazuo Ishiguro, who once taught here and called the area the County of Lost Things, a magical place where every lost object will one day be found. The same could be said of Norwich City, that lovable yo-yo team who've bounced in and out of the Premier League without ever truly establishing themselves. Yet over the past season, they've been refashioned by a young German manager, Daniel Farker, who's remade the culture of the club, blending a European tactical rigour with a young British optimism and achieved the impossible, not only gaining promotion to the Premier League, but making this team and the city somehow appear like a hipster's bastion. Norwich has almost become cool. How would you describe the town of Norwich? Well, the city of Norwich. Thank We're you. very proud of it being a city. It's fantastically welcoming, it's beautiful, it's engaging and it's, it's vibrant as well. Around 250,000 people reside in Norwich, but actually uh, the actual county itself is one of the biggest in England. It's a relatively kind of closed off area. To be brutally honest, the only thing going on half the time is the football club. <laughs> it's the, the centre of Norfolk life for so many people. What is unique as a club in terms of its brand about Norwich City when you think about it? Well, firstly, our colours. Our colours kind of stand alone. The, the yellow and green are really vibrant. You should see it on a match day, you know, that early season games where everyone's in their shirt, you know, it must be off-putting, it must be fearsome for another team coming here and seeing that yellow wall, as we coined that <laughs> nickname for the Barclay end this season. It's a team with distinct colours, whose fan base believe the tenacity of their passion separates them from the rest. But it's also a club that, despite being founded way back in 1902, has just two major trophies to its name. Cynics would say there's not a lot else that comes to mind in that 117-year history. We've had a couple of highlights. I mean, I wasn't around for, the, for one of the most famous, the 59 Cup run. We claimed a couple of big scalps there, but 92, 93, it was a, a really famous time and some of our greatest city legends played during that period. When the Premier League was started, Norwich were one of the founding clubs. They had a season that dreams are almost made of. A lot, of, a lot of people outside Norfolk probably wonder why they still go on about it, but they didn't have a big budget. They started the first Premier League season favourites for relegation, and then they finished third. That third place finish qualified Norwich for the UEFA Cup, the European precursor to the Europa League, setting up a fairy tale run that still resonates emotionally on these streets. I remember everyone in the country rooting for Norwich. Everyone else had gone out of Europe by that point. Nor it, was, it was only Norwich, and everyone wanted them to do well. Norwich's still beloved UEFA Cup run hit its peak in the second round when the Canaries met German powerhouse Bayern Munich. I don't think you could ever quite have believed it. But Jeremy Goss's volley, it's been recreated on T-shirts, uh, on YouTube channels. And then, you know, as that second goal went in, it was incredible. Up and down the land, take your hats off to Norwich City. The club's magnificent 2-1 win in Munich has been described as the pinnacle of Norwich City's history. Two weeks later, Norwich drew with Bayern at Carrow Road and advanced on aggregate, only to be knocked out by Inter Milan in the next round. When you think of Norwich's modern history, there's a lot of promotion, there's a lot of relegation. When that cycle happens at Norwich, a club that had been relegated four times in the Premier League era, which is a record, does it hurt as much? No, it always hurts. When you have, whenever you're relegated, it, it always hurts, but you would probably say that this is probably one, one of the most exciting clubs to watch. It's never boring, you know, never really mid-table. It's always fighting for something, whether it's going up or coming down. So, you know, as a fan, I think you've got your money's worth over the last 10 years. Darren Huckabee has levelled it for Norwich City. The Canaries have come from behind again. Sheer delight. Last relegation, 2016, club didn't invest properly upon promotion, then tried to throw money desperately at the problem in January. You went down, but you went down singing. There was, there was really defiance on the pitch, and the fans sang about relegation. They said, Ipswich Town, we're coming for you. Norwich City fans 
always almost at their best when all hope is lost. You gave me goosebumps there, actually reliving that. The last 10 minutes of that was absolutely mind-blowing. When it's sunk in, OK, look, we're going down. Well, let's show them what we're about. And suddenly, this stadium just stood, and there were flags waving, and there were people singing, there's people crying right, left, and centre, but it was a defiant cry. Despite being condemned to the championship, the spirit and passion surrounding Norwich City has never dimmed. And that's thanks, in part, to a celebrity chef turned club owner. What is Delia Smith? She is a culinary goddess and incredibly popular and well-liked. Everyone else who's done it since is because Delia did it first. She's the queen of cookery, OK, and is probably almost uh, akin to royal family in England. She is so iconic. Bet you didn't know that she cooked the cake, or baked the cake, that is on the front cover of the Rolling Stones album, Let It Bleed. There you go. How about that? That's Delia Smith I don't know if you. you capture that on camera, but my mind <laughs> is blowing. Holding the sieve up nice and high, this flour has also got a teaspoonful of baking powder in with it. As one of the first celebrity chefs in British popular culture, how did you fall in love, then, with Norwich City? Well, um, I married a Norwich City supporter. Michael Wynne-Jones? Yeah. I liked football anyway before that. And when Michael's father died, I took over his season ticket and didn't look back. And then back in 1996, yeah. you two stepped in and became majority shareholders in the club. That's right, yes. Financially, it was collapsing. We watched all our best players being sold. It just got worse and worse. And we were all hoping somebody would take it over. We got invited by the chairman at the time out for supper and he said, um, is there any chance that you and Michael would invest in the club for half a million pounds? Um, you could have a seat on the board. So we immediately said, we'll give you a million for two seats on the board. <laughs> It's one of the most expensive dinners in history. Yeah. Somebody said, what's the most expensive thing you ever bought? I said, a football <laughs> club. <laughs> what does Norwich City provide in your life that you were missing? At the root, football is a very beautiful game. And also, I have quite deep uh, feelings about what football does uh, for the community. In fact, football is community. What's wrong with the world at the moment is human beings aren't connected. Football connects human beings together. They suffer together, they have joy together, and they're one. At its best, football makes fans feel alive, as Smith herself once proved in a now notorious half-time hype speech to fans. It's at a home game against Manchester City, you took the mic, you famously gave your rally cry. You took a lot of flack for that, but when I watched it, I loved it. <laughs> to me. A lot of people did. <laughs> to me, it's the wonder of football. It yeah. really is. And I thought, I watched you, and I yeah. saw the joy of fandom. Yeah. And I saw someone, Norwich City, almost had empowered you to just let loose all of that emotion. I mean, it was very spontaneous. It wasn't planned. I forgot Sky was there. You forgot the global broadcast. Yes. <laughs> it's an easy mistake to make. I won't be candid, because ultimately, okay. when you're feeling dark in life, you watch that film, it's impossible not to feel lifted. It's won me a lot of friends everywhere in football, I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. After a fourth relegation from the Premier League in 2016, change at Norwich was needed, and it started in April of 2017. You decided to build a whole new culture here, starting with a change of leadership. You bring in Stuart Webber as sporting director from Huddersfield. Delia, why him? Well, he'd had enormous success. Michael and I interviewed Stuart and we didn't look back. Stuart Webber, after Norwich are relegated in 2016, you arrived from Huddersfield and you pretty much have to re-engineer the club's culture here. What, what were the values of the club that you came to? 
it's obviously been a difficult sort of time and a difficult period for the club and probably by their own admission you know that they would say they lost their way and they lost what the clear sort of direction and what the club should sort of stand for you know we don't have massive financial opportunities so if you don't have money you've got to work harder and you've got to be more creative and you've got to take more risks for us to be competitive we have to do that we can't just rely on buying the best players or whatever because we don't have the conditions for that so we have to find another way we have to find our way Stuart Webber he grabbed the club he shook it he got rid of all the bits that he didn't feel were going to be very helpful going forward and he's driven such a cultural change that this club is in so many ways unrecognizable to how it was before he arrived in terms of search for a new manager, Daniel Fark, he was running a reserve side in Germany. What was it impressed you about him in interview and made you think he's the man to lead us to the Premier League promised land? Well, I think, first of all, the sort of brilliant move was from Stuart. Stuart actually discovered Daniel. And I first met Daniel, what struck me, which is quite unusual in football, humble. Here is a man who is not an ego. That is like worth its weight. And that's the Norwich way. Yeah, that's the Norwich way. You were at Huddersfield. You found David Wagner. What drew you to Daniel Farkey? I'd got to know Daniel while I was still at Huddersfield because, you know, he was someone that we were interested in if um, in the event that David would go. And when, obviously, I came here, I went and spoke to him about, not talking to you about Huddersfield this time, it's, it's a different project. It wasn't going to be a quick fix. We needed a, a coach who'd come on that journey with us and he needed to be sure of us that we would, you know, allow him to be on that journey and not after a bit of pressure from the outside, oh no, change it and do the fashionable thing in football, which is change the manager. Norwich wasn't your only option. You've said the project at Carrow Road, however, was the right one. This was an underperforming team that had tight finances. I'm genuinely fascinated, Daniel. Why was this the right one from your perspective? Because it was the biggest uh, challenge, uh, to be honest. So um, there were different, different other options, perhaps easier steps. But I was sure when I'm uh, able to, to, to bring success uh, to this club under these circumstances, this condition, then you're prepared for everything in football. That's what yeah, it was. That's what appealed to you. Like, if I can do this, I can do anything. Yeah, even as a coach, you're a competitor. And that's the reason I uh, started here. It wasn't an easy start, Daniel. You finished a disappointing 14th in the table. What did you learn from that first season? I was never naive and I was never expecting that it would be an easy way. I expected setbacks and we all uh, believed in, in the way we want to go and uh, the way we want to achieve things. And it's quite important that you stick with your principles. The board deserve a lot of respect for keeping faith in Fark's vision, because a lot of other clubs might have had that hook ready. You didn't. I know, but I mean, don't we all know it doesn't work? That doesn't work. <laughs> you know, why, don't, why doesn't everybody understand that you've got to give somebody time? You've got to. Internally, you could see it working, but fundamentally on the pitch, the results weren't quite what we wanted. We weren't scoring enough goals, and, and quite rightly at that time, we were getting some criticism. So yeah, of course, it brings doubt. But then it suddenly all clicked. Fark ball materialised. What changed? You watched it all. Tell me, what suddenly clicked? The style of football, the actual game of football, was being played as it should be, and it was happy. magic. Norwich have passed it forward well, and it's Aaron's breaking on the right-hand side. To Vrancic, roll oh, back into the penalty. A great ball, Aaron's across. Puki does score! Puki does score! What a well-worked goal that is! I look back at the start of the season and go, did I fully expect us to have a much better season? Yes. Did I expect us to win the league? No. Because I don't think anyone can expect to actually win the championship. A roar booms out across this city. A roar which tells this city that Premier League football is coming back to Norwich. What is fart life? It's, like, it's well, not just football, it's a world view almost. Have you heard the Blur song called Park Life? I live that song. So, well, we, that's what we sing. We sing, you know, all the, all the Germans. So we don't many, sing all the people. So many it's Germans. All the Germans. So many Germans. There you go. Hand in hand. Hand in hand with their... Park, Park Life. life. God, this is one of the greatest days of my life, singing Park <laughs> Life with Delia Smith. <laughs>
some great days with this team. You've had some dark days with this team. You've got moments of wonder for this community. Yeah. When you sing that song and you love it, what do you feel inside? Can you put that into words? For you them? just said the word, wonder. My name is Shin, and I'm from Japan, and I have a restaurant in Norwich, and I am a great supporter of Norwich City Football Club. You have a baby, a yes. beautiful baby, April the 23rd, baby Kiriku. Yes. You're looking for a middle name, as you do. You wanted something that encapsulates the whole Norwich world view. Exactly. And then I asked um, my wife, Michael, and she came up with Fark Life. <laughs> Micah, this was your idea? Yeah, yeah. Go on. Oh, inclusivity. <laughs> yeah. Togetherness. Yeah. Love. Yeah. What could be more Norwich than that? I don't know. Only him, Fark Life. Lovely ball, Timu Puki's in, Puki scores for Norwich! And they have their first Premier League goal upon returning to the top flight. He's off the mark in the Premier League. You've scouted together and recruited. Just some unbelievable stories. Timu Puki, a journeyman player, struggled to break through in Scottish football. What made you think he, he's going to be a potent goal scorer? People almost describe him as if he must have been crap before we signed him. They forget that he played 65 times for his country and, you know, has scored 12 goals or whatever. Everyone thought Timu had failed at every club. And then at Bromby, he didn't fail. He did really well in the Danish league and Norwich were able to find a way of looking at him, seeing what he does and working out that that would actually fit really well into what they were doing the season before. The best free transfer anyone's ever done in the championship. I don't think there's a debate. Aaron's on the right-hand side, crosses Puki! How would you describe your style of play to people who've not seen you play? Because you've got the ability to score a lot of goals with clutch, clinical, intelligent finishes. I would say that's that's one of my strengths. I'm clever how, how I move, and uh, obviously this team last year we had a good teammate, so, so it was easy to just be in the right place, and I knew I would get the pass and just tap it in. We'd be lying if we sat here and said, oh yeah, he'll come and score 29 goals and we'll win the <laughs> league. That would be a lie, but... Both Daniel and I and the scouting team were convinced that Timu could be a success here. And so, yeah, for us, it wasn't as, uh, probably as big a surprise as others. What life lesson do we learn from your career? That skill for footballers is crucial, but tenacity and perseverance is more important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think I had to grow as a person quite a lot. And I think the last three, four years, I've grown even more. I think that's why also now I have a chance to play Premier League because I, I had to grow up as a person and now, now I'm ready. Puki! Sensational! A hat-trick for Timo Puki, outstanding in the championship and already leaving his mark in the Premier League. Step two, utilising the Youth Academy. You made first team regulars out of fresh-faced fullbacks, Max Ahrens, Jamal Lewis, Todd Cantwell. What is the secret? So we played probably with the youngest back four in, in whole Western Europe, and it's it's always important to speak with them and to work unbelievable hard and to be even a bit a bit more more strict with them in order to improve them. But there's also a lot of a uh, lot of trust, and um, I got the feeling that when they're prepared to to perform, then uh, I throw them in, and if they deliver, uh, they have all the right to to be in the spotlight. Max Ahrens. One year ago, no one else uh, would have thought uh, he could be a professional football player and, and we trusted him. But the biggest credit goes to, to Max himself because we could bring him pretty close to the door, but he had to make the step through the door and he worked in an unbelievable way and for that he deserves all the praise. Max Ahrens is brilliant. It's like someone really good at FIFA is controlling him. He just knows what to do around the pitch. You broke into that first team a year and a half ago. Can you describe what that's like for us? Stepping up, essentially, as a high school kid. It's hard, obviously, I'm still young, I'm still 19, so it's sometimes it's hard to, to keep up with like, the pace, everything like that, but uh, I like to think it's, it's going well. But when you watch it afterwards on YouTube, you're like, yeah, of course I just did that. 
so sometimes you, you have to appreciate what you've done, but so I always look to, to improve um, my game. So a lot of the time when I'm watching the games back, I think, where could I have done better here? Where could I have done better here? But no, sometimes you, I, I definitely look and think, yeah, wow, that was a nice bit of play. <laughs> can you believe it's you? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, I can. I back myself and I trust in my ability, so, yeah. Aaron's breakthrough campaign earned him EFL Young Player of the Season recognition and was just one reason why Norwich are back in the big time. Now they'll be up against England's elite and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the world's wealthiest clubs. Can you battle the piles of cash that is the Premier League with brains? We're not deluded. We know it's going to be extremely difficult. We know we're everybody's favourites to go down. We'll know we'll spend the least money. We'll have the smallest budget, etc., etc. But that is what we are, and we're not ashamed of that. We're not frightened of it, and, and that should be exciting. If that doesn't turn people on, what does? We are realistic. We are probably the biggest favourite uh, for position 20 in the next season, but we broke so many rules in the past, and we are also aiming for breaking uh, several rules also in the future. I mean, the one thing I know about football is I don't know anything, <laughs> and neither does anyone else. <laughs> so there is always this cliff edge. And when it goes well, it'll be wonderful. And when it doesn't go well, what, what did we expect? The key for me is if we fail, it's we fail doing it our way, not fail trying to do it somebody else's way. I think we just have to be realistic that it's a very competitive league, potentially the most competitive league in the world. Three teams have to drop out of it every year. What we have to do is make ourselves a sustainable Premier League club and stay around as long as we possibly can. Norwich City are everything that's good about English football. A club that's remained authentically true to its local roots. And in a game awash with money, have built success by thinking differently, bringing a tenacity and collectivity to every game they play. And a fan base who, win or lose, savour the good moments and remain defiant, singing joyfully even in the face of defeat, making collective memories week in, week out, which is what football at the end of the day is really about. What in your heart, Dealey, as we sit here, what do you believe is possible this Premier League season for Norwich City? Anything. Anything's possible. Anything is possible.